We uh, will go down the line then and introduce our panelists. We've already heard from uh, Mr. Fabrice Coquio, who is the Managing Director of Interaction France. And to his left is Mr. Keith Shaw, the Vice President of Business Development for Europe, Middle East, and Africa at Equinix. Uh, to his uh, left, we have Mr. Todd Rahimi, who is the Founder and Managing Director of Lambda Consulting. And to his left, we have Wei Guo Chang, who is the Director of Network Planning and Product Development at China Telecom Global. And finally, we have uh, Mr. Mahesh Jaishankar, who is the Vice President of International Connectivity and Infrastructure at Do. So uh, I'd like to just uh, actually start by having each one of you uh, maybe uh, very quickly uh, explain your presence and involvement in the uh, data center industry. Um, actually, I'll start uh, at the other end with, uh, with Mahesh, if you could uh, just explain the role of DO uh, in the uh, Sure. Um, for those who don't know, DO is a telecom operator in the Middle East. Uh, we are a full-fledged integrated operator with mobile fixed line and wholesale services. Uh, we're relatively new, about 10 years old. Uh, we ventured into the data center business uh, along with Equinix a few years ago in, as an alliance. We saw a gap between Frankfurt and Singapore for a reliable data hub and we built a project called Data Mina around it. And that was our entry into the data center uh, world. We have been consortium members at uh, EIG and with CME5, uh, and also LAN GBI and Falcon, so have a mix of both submarine and data center, which is part of our discussion today. Thank you, Mahesh, and Wei Guo. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I'm from China Telecom. Uh, China Telecom, uh, talking about China, you know, you, I think you know China Telecom. So China Telecom is the leading carrier in China. So we have, traditionally we, we, we don't have the big data center, but now we are having data centers in Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, US, and uh, European as well. So, but uh, from the op operator's perspective, so it's, uh, we are changing our pop to the data centers in some major cities. So the two uh, major international carriers that we're very lucky to have, and then also we have uh, Todd Rahimi from uh, Lambda Consulting. If you could just explain. Uh, yeah, Lambda. thanks, Michael. Uh, Lambda Consulting uh, is an alternative legal services provider that provides the innovative delivery of legal services to telecom companies. Uh, over the years, we've, we've negotiated uh, contracts for, for space and data centers all around the world. And when in the context of, of this conference and this discussion, we talk about uh, c international cable systems and where they terminate, whether you call that a data center or a landing station. We've negotiated on behalf of clients uh, landing arrangements in more than 20 countries around the world over the years. And then we'll uh, move on then to the uh, two specialized uh, data center operators. Uh, Keith, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, Equinix for we haven't heard. Equinix is a tier three, seven, nine data center. It's been in existence for knocking on 18 years. We have approximately 1,400 network operators. We have become the hub of the cloud. We have now in excess of 500 clouds deployed with us. And more recently, we've been in, uh, expanding into new markets. And I'm very proud to announce we've just acquired Lisbon, Madrid, Seville, and Barcelona. More recently, we've been playing very strongly in the submarine cable world. And in the three years that we've engaged strongly with submarine cables, we've won systems such as Monet in Miami and 13 other systems globally, which is amalgamated in adding approximately 708 terabits of new data and traffic through Equinix data centers. So we aim to become the home for interconnection and the hub where people meet and connect. Thank you. And uh, Fabrice, we've, we've heard uh, from Interaction, but maybe if you want to just add. Uh, yeah, what you I think uh, everybody uh, had the chance to understand that we uh, operate 45 data centers in Europe. Um, where we um, uh, manage connectivity between our customers so that they create value. And I think that people as all have also understood that uh, we are in Marseille. So I'd just like to start with uh, a fairly uh, open-ended question on, on the commercial side of things, and I'll, I'll start by directing it towards our two uh, operators. Um, 
how are today's demands for connectivity, resiliency, and uh, round-the-clock uh, uh, high reliability and high availability, how are these affecting the way that uh, data centers are built and located? If I may uh, attempt an answer at this. Uh, we see the internet, and I, I, I'm sure we've, we've heard this multiple times here. The internet's getting decentralized. We see the, the content, and for, especially for somebody from the Middle East like us. We used to have about 97% of our traffic coming from Europe or from, uh, from US, and we have seen that go down to about 60% in the last five years. So this is what is happening is we see that the internet is getting decentralized. We see a lot of that content coming closer and closer to us. So what that does is that is prompting us, or that's pushing us to build data centers as close as the consumers, and as close to the consumers as possible. So it takes the pressure off submarine cables, because the content's coming closer to us, but it puts the pressure on having large, reliable data centers, giving good latency, connectivity in the region. So that's how we see it, and that's what we're working with. We built an internet exchange in our data center primarily to make sure that our customers get the latency that, that they're looking for. So that's what large content players are looking for. So that's, and, and that's at the end what the end customers, we also have retail customers. We have mobile and fixed customers. And we do hear what they are looking for. So I think we've got the ability of uh, addressing what the carrier and the wholesale is looking for and what the retail customer is looking for. That's, so that's how we see uh, the evolution of both the data center and the submarine cable uh, for us. I don't know if I answered the question, but I did. Wei uh, Guo, the, uh, the China Telecom International view? Yes, also still from the carrier's perspective. So the carrier in the past, we always talked the SRA 9, uh, 59s. So now they're in the international, so in the past, the, the, the traffic is not big. But, but now that we have a terabit, terabit per second cable, so if the cable cut, then we cannot guarantee the, the, five, the five nines for the international interconnectivity. So, uh, so we think it's a, it's a, we, we, do need, we do need for more cables to guarantee the major data center connectivity. Try to reach five nines, but it's very challenging. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that sentiment. I think that uh, it, on, on this stage yesterday, Michael talked about the fact that it, the, the systems now have to be totally redundant, so you could take a data center out of the mix completely and still see no, no impact on services, right? So uh, but you, I heard you say that, that perhaps uh, getting closer to the customer uh, is taking the, the, the pressure off submarine networks, right? But I think, I think getting closer to the customer is actually leading to an increase in, in investment in both cables and data centers to, to the point where reliability is a given even if one system or one data center goes down. We have found that now we have a, a good collection of subsea cables deployed with us, but they will deploy in markets such as London, Singapore, Shanghai, Helsinki, and they are building systems that they, they have reliability built in and the fact that, okay, Equinix has never gone down, but they have that stretch and ability to be in many markets and many continents. And you see that the cloud providers, which are key, are deploying in a number of markets. And Mahesh made a very good point that historically there was deployments in London and Singapore, and people are seeing much, much more about the importance of Dubai, the importance of Johannesburg, and the importance of these new emerging markets. So it is important to have the cloud is localized and reachable by everyone. Uh, maybe just an additional comment. C c connectivity has always been at the heart of our mission in, in data centers, neutral, carrier neutral data centers. So e exchanging with uh, uh, cable, submarine cables, that's, that's quite obvious. Maybe the only thing is that in the last two, three years, the, um, uh, data center market moved maybe in some places, some hubs, from the, uh, the concept of city-centric to gateways between continents. And this changes the picture and how the importance of collaboration between uh, uh, submarine cables and data centers will evolve uh, more and more.
And we see that in many places from Miami, Singapore, Marseille, or some other places, Helsinki, wherever. Uh, this combination is crucial and it, it changes the way people exchange content machine to machine or machine to humans uh, through uh, this infrastructure. That's a very good point. Mr. Larry Schwartz was very kind to mention the development of, of Brazil. A number of years ago, people would not have believed how much Sao Paulo is now on the map. But we have three DCs there deployed already, but there are a number of cables and a lot of interest connecting the southern part of the globe in that way, so I completely agree. Sticking on the, uh, on the commercial discussion then, um, and maybe moving away from, from geography necessarily towards uh, the, the customer groups. Um, can you talk about how the, uh, uh, the content players are, are driving the development of a decentralized internet infrastructure and, uh, and just how you're adapting to, uh, to the major, major customer groups? And I think particularly everyone wants to know about the, uh, the requirements of the, of the Facebooks and the Googles and the Microsofts of the world, how, how they're handling that. Um, do you view them as an addressable market? I know a lot of their uh, traffic is, is handled in-house, but uh, increasingly uh, uh, a good share of it is, is outsourced. So, um, uh, yeah, um, Mahesh, if you could just talk about the, uh, the customer groups and, and particularly the, uh, the content providers. Yes, and, and if you remember Alan's presentation yesterday, you see the content players are like almost equal to the telecom operators in terms of occupying capacity on the, on the subsea cable. So increasingly we see that. We see that the content players are making, so this is continuation of what I said in the earlier point that there is a decentralization of it happening and the content players are coming. They are putting the money in to come in as close as possible to the data centers, to the regional market. So we see presence of, actually, I think it was yesterday that Amazon announced a big deployment in the Middle East. So they are, they've announced a very large deployment in the Middle East. Uh, they're putting their nodes, uh, part of it with us. And so now, w what that signifies is this is one of their largest deployments in, in, in the region. They're coming closer to the customer. So this, this shows the fact that the content players are moving in. It, it wouldn't be far-fetched to think that they would look at investing into cables to bring, in, bring it into the data centers into the future. So in the next five years, I, and I, I, I look at business cases for my company for submarine cables, and it is extremely difficult to, um, to justify a uh, submarine cable today. I did the business case for CME5 uh, a few years ago, and the price today, what it sells at, is not what I had in my business plan. So uh, I look at it and my CFO is saying, Mahesh, you are off by a factor of half of what, I, the, what the price I put on it. So it becomes increasingly difficult to justify submarine cable investments for a telecom operator. But I guess as the, as the trend shifts, it becomes increasingly easy for the content player to justify that, uh, that investment into that submarine cable. And you will see them doing it. And, and because we have, and because there is such significant leverage that they have on us as telecom operators, I mean, each of, uh, I don't know if you saw one of the presentations yesterday, about 30 to 40 percent of our content comes from these, uh, these content players. So they have a high level of leverage on the telecom operator. So, so there is an asymmetry of negotiating power at the moment. Well, the view from China Telecom. So uh, I think we, we can have a different view. So you say the carrier is evolved. So act actually the, the landscape for the service provider is the ecosystem. So the, some carrier evolved to the uh, more data heavy carrier. Some still keep the traditional ways. But another side is OTT. OTT now they have a very big uh, data demands. Uh, they are also evolved. Maybe they evolve to the carrier direction. We carrier evolved to the OTT direction. As China Telecom, we 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 are the combination. We have a traditional business. We have the internet. We have connectivity. We also have some uh, data centers. So I think it depends on how carrier your business change. If we can transform to the to the OTT direction successfully, then we do need the more, more cable, C cable. 
for the connectivities and the reliabilities. Keith, go ahead. We behave somewhat differently. We've listened to the cloud providers and their deployments. And in EMEA, there's a very strong deployment of cloud in Finland and Sweden. And that has driven us to build more data centers in the Helsinki region. And at the same time, we've seen cables that have been built very quickly, such as Cinea C-Line 1 and Eastern Light, who have been powering the interconnection of these cloud providers into these markets. And that has also, that goes back to Mahesh's point again. People were surprised at us deploying data center space and, and abilities in Dubai, but the market was driving us. And now, as Mahesh mentioned again, we have AWS, we have Microsoft, we have others looming over those markets. So although we are building Amsterdam 10 or, or another market in Ashburn, we also have to look at these new markets and these new edge markets. I think people are not looking enough, for example, at Nigeria, which has 140 million people and has a fantastic film industry. It doesn't have Netflix, it doesn't have these things. And these, these kind of cloud activities linked with IOA or IoT is driving where we're looking to deploy and it's pushing guys like Mr. Mike Cunningham earlier and Larry to look at new routes and a new way to deploy cables. So I think it's important that whether it's the CSPs or the clouds or Facebook or Google or AWS or Apple who are yet to show their hand, that this is driving the change in data center deployment and subsea deployment. I fully agree that uh, I think that whether we like it or not, you know, uh, uh, OTTs, because of their huge appetite for data center space and connectivity, uh, are changing the, the, our world in the, for the coming five or ten years. Uh, addressing new markets where there is no infrastructure is a challenge. Uh, addressing um, some markets, particularly, you know, in very dense and congested, in a way, uh, cities like in Europe, is, is all another challenge in terms of getting space, power, and so on for, for this. How we're going to solve this? By, once again, listening and partnering with these players, which are key drivers for our industry. I was just going to say, it's, it's, I think that the, the rise of the OTTs is not only pushing, uh, as Keith was talking about, pushing people to consider new geographies, but it's also you know, from our experience at Lambda, pushing the, the operators to change their terms and conditions, to change their, their models, blurring the lines between assets and services agreements, you know, push, pushing uh, the SLAs, pushing refund rights, et cetera, and really, really pushing the entire uh, concept of, of what they're buying to, to a whole new area. Can I just pick up on one point my esteemed colleague made? The average data center takes more power, space, and cooling than a small town. And it's been an Equinix incentive to make sure, and many have followed and are doing the same thing. But it's important in Silicon Valley, we fully embrace solar. The reasons, I believe, and Mr. Stephen Grubb can help me with this, but Facebook deployed in Finland because of the cooling abilities. And we actually, in Helsinki, we pull chilled water out of the ground and use that to help cool. So we have to also look at how we power these new economies, how we light them, and how we cool them. It's very important, but to be environmentally friendly. So uh, I think it's uh, the carrier, uh, the OTT actually it's a New, should be, we can redefine the carrier, the, the OTT is a new carrier, the next generation carrier. But uh, the traditional carrier, it actually have some social responsibility to coverage everywhere. But for the OTT, they only reach some, how to say, open, open market. Okay, in the future, the OTT, if the they also take some social responsibility, universal service responsibility. Then 
I think it's a, it's a, the, the carrier and OTT will be quite balanced. I think I'd like to jump ahead to, uh, to the regulatory issue, um, and in particular looking at, uh, at uh, trends in, in regulation uh, that directly impact the data center industry, uh, particularly um, data privacy protection regulations, um, data localization. Uh, Todd, could you uh, get us started on the, on the regulatory aspect? Yeah, sure. And I, I, obviously, data protection uh, is, is very much in the news with Equifax uh, recently. Uh, but be before I talk about that, I, I'd like to mention the fact that the, the convergence between cable systems and data centers is also going to lead to a change in licensing obligations. You know, at the moment, uh, we negotiate a, uh, you, you apply for a license, for example, to land in the United States, you have to negotiate a national security agreement with Team Telecom. And it, there are certain obligations on the licensee to protect access to the system, to provide access to the various government agencies in the event of a disaster, certain obligations you have. But if you're actually landing at a data center, um, you know, the obligations sit with a licensee. But you need access or you need to have these rights at the data center. So I see the licensing obligations expanding to include data centers. Also, with the OTTs taking fiber pairs, the open cable system, the open cable model, I think that the licensing obligations will extend beyond just, you know, the pure cable operator as well. So that, that's, I think, something to watch, that the, the data centers will have their own national security agreements that they have to enter into. In terms of the data protection, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not a policy wonk. You know, other people can debate uh, whether, whether the data protection rules are, are actually, you know, digital protectionism. Uh, but the reality is international trade today is comprised of the transfer of data across borders, right? And, and, and cable operators are, are a, a big piece of that. And if, and if you look at the, the patchwork of regulations around data privacy, you know, so some of these laws say that you cannot transfer personal information without a, a consumer's consent. Then you also have data localization requirements. And you have the extension, for example, in the EU of uh, that these rules apply not only to data controllers, like the people that acquire the personal information, but also the data processors. Now that can be, that can capture the cloud providers, that can capture the, the Equinexes of the world, it can capture the cable operators. And, you know, it's, 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 it's an unknown area, something that, that is, is bound to expand. Um, regulators are becoming ever more protective and ever more aggressive in levying fines. If, if you look at the financial services industry, since 2008, there's been over $300 billion in fines levied for, for failure to comply. And at the moment, if you look in our industry, you've got a patchwork of regulations in, in every different country. You cannot build a global standard. And you have to build bespoke systems in each country, and you have to build them in an interconnected fashion between cable operators and data center operators in order to be able to comply with the law. The, the reality is at the moment, I'm sure everyone in this room is not in compliance with some regulatory obligation somewhere in the world. Um, and I think that uh, Ken Bressy just talked earlier today about the China cybersecurity law and the fact that it imposes criminal penalties. And I think push for criminal penalties is only going to grow if you look at the Equifax situation. They sat on this information for six weeks. Some of the executives were trading the stock uh, before releasing the information about the breach. So criminal penalties are going to become, I think, more and more, and more part, of the, part of the issue, right? And I, I think it's, a, it's an area where convergence between cable operators and data centers needs to happen not only at the physical level, but also in the compliance level as well. Uh, Keith, the, the Equinix uh, experience or expectations with uh, the regulatory environment? I've been somewhat enjoying it. We have more and more Russian operators deploying in Helsinki. And we've seen many people look at deploying in different markets. I can't comment to Todd's level, but we are very aware of the regulations and the laws. And we've always stipulated we do not touch or interfere with anyone's data whatsoever. 
but our customers, whether they're large or small, international or geographic group, we've seen some unusual activity. The same with subsea. We've seen a lot of interest in building subsea via Panama and avoiding the United States. And we've seen people now looking, exiting the UK or England and deploying in Amsterdam or, or Ireland. So I think they're aware of it. We have a very good legal team. But I think you know, Todd's made a very valid point, is that someone the size of Equinix or a small company or an international player or a subsea operator needs to be aware of the law and, and more recently in the news what's going on and, and be aware of that. But today, I've just seen people deploying in different markets to avoid the issue. Is, is that an option for interaction? Yeah, uh, maybe a compliment only. The large players like Equinix or Interaction, we are used to, to deal with multiple rules, uh, regulations, obligations uh, in different cities, different countries. Uh, the, the, the fact that this is going to be more and more the case of more regulations, more control everywhere, and not only in, in, uh, in more difficult countries, but uh, also in, you know, in very open markets like the US or Europe, uh, will maybe represent a new barrier for new entrants also in the data center business because you need that expertise to be able to manage this uh, in collaboration with your customers and educate also customers not knowing exactly when they land equipment in a particular city uh, what are the actual rules there it's an opportunity. It, so it's a it's an expert business in a way <laughs> if i can just add my two cents here uh, i think the intentions are very good of the agencies in terms of trying to do it. Uh, as you mentioned, there's a lot of ambiguity and lack of clarity about how to do it. Uh, some, of, some of the penalties are extremely uh, onerous. They, they can be, like if you look at the EU's uh, GDPR, uh, it's 4% of your turnover. I mean, this is huge. Uh, so we have to be careful. We have to be cognizant of doing business in, in each of these areas. Um, we have seen a lot of customers use this. Uh, they do host locally because of that. They try their best within the knowledge that they have. And as you probably said, you would not be in, you would probably be violating the, some of these uh, regulations, but that's the best you're trying to do um, among them. We do not offer this advice or any advice to our customers, obviously, because we, we are not legal experts, but we do tell them that these are the things that you need to be conscious of. Uh, in terms of uh, regulations, and uh, it does, as Keith mentioned, sometimes provide opportunities for us to say you could host it locally and, and have uh, have your data in the country itself. We grow the, the info so comes I'd like to add something uh, about the uh, openness of the data or, or, or submarine cable. So now that in submarine industry, we are talking about open cable. Actually, the open cable is not really open because technology, we can say that's open technology cable, but uh, we have regulatory, we have a permit, we have, yeah, we have the access. Yeah, many issues cannot be open. Just like, like something, some people want to get visa to some country. Not everybody have the same privilege to get a visa. It's an open country, but you cannot get visa to there, maybe. So I think that's an analogy to the open, open cable concept. So talking about the data center, the data center is an open data center or it's a closed open data center? Or it's a, I think that's a half open, half, yeah, it's difficult, it's a it's complex issue. Well, I think whether it's open, good, good point, I think whether it's open or closed, you know, the, the, the issue is the security of, of the data, right? And I think that when you have the, the convergence among cloud providers and local data storage and transmission across borders, the, the requirement to get together and come up with a, some sort of interconnected compliance system is critical because if you look at the notification requirements in the EU, the, the question is going to become where did the breach occur, right? And, and ultimately, 
uh, if, a, if a cable operator lands at an Equinex as the landing station, you know, uh, it, people get pretty frustrated if they stand and point at each other saying it wasn't our fault, right? They're going to expect an integrated model to be able to resolve these kind of issues. Maybe move on now to uh, the relationship between the, uh, the submarine cable industry and the data center industry. We've already talked a little bit about it, but um, can I just go down the, uh, the, uh, the, the aisle here and hear your thoughts on what the, the model of the future is in terms of submarine and data center convergence? Um, I think the submarine industry has always been very fearful of commoditization, uh, that uh, uh, there's a need to sell some product other than just raw bandwidth, and there's always been a move in, movement to, to manage bandwidth products, uh, and increasingly into some form of, 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 of data center service, or at least something that's encroaching in the data center model. Um, i definitely like to, to hear from, from the two operators to begin with in terms of uh, uh, how uh, do and China Telecom are positioning themselves to, to try and leverage uh, submarine infrastructure with their data center infrastructure. Is there a move towards offering an integrated product? Um, uh, and how can the cable deployment uh, be adapted to uh, enhance the data center infrastructure? Sure. I, I'd like to just start by just moving away a little bit from that question itself and saying, let's look at what, what do our customers want? What, what do our enterprise customers want? Our enterprise customers are increasingly moving toward cloud deployments. They're moving their IT infrastructure into the cloud. And what does that mean? The, the data center and the sub, subsea cables are infrastructures that support this, these deployments. So increasingly, the, the enterprise is not looking at the components of this cloud solution. They're going to buy the cloud. Hence, we as operators need to mesh this data center and subsea cable capacity into a, a viable proposition for them, which is invisible to the, to the enterprise itself. So I'm, I'm talking still, still at a very 30,000 feet kind of, a, kind of a level for the enterprise itself. And what, what we are increasingly seeing also is that customers want this on demand. On the 25th of every month, they want additional virtual machines. They want to tear it down at the end of the month because the payroll is over. Hence, they want more bandwidth, they want more uh, computing power. That needs to come into our subsea cable capacity. That needs to come into the entire infrastructure. It has to become end-to-end. -end. So that's where we see this going. We see the submarine cables and the data centers very meshed together, being part of one proposition to the end customer, which is then delivered by the cloud operator to the enterprise or uh, a value-added reseller who puts it all together. And the ability to be flexible, to have bandwidth on demand, to have, I think we'll have to move away from fixed one-year contracts, five-year contracts, into something more hourly basis kind of a thing. So it's not now, probably five years from now, or probably in a couple of years. But we'll have to look at our subsea cable contracts, changing our, our entire model changing. Uh, that's, that's the vision that we see happening. Probably not now, but we need to be geared to a point where all of this becomes flexible and very, very much fluid. So the, from uh, Carol's perspective, the, uh, in the last mile, we have a fiber to the home, right? So actually, for the, from the international segment point of view, so the, we can say maybe it's a C cable to the data center in the future. But it depends. It's a, it, I think the cable uh, and data center combination together, integrated together, is one option. The traditional option is still there. But because, because from country to country, there are different situations different policy, different uh, technology, different uh, uh, competitive landscape. So I think in the future, that's, that's one way driven mainly by the next generation carrier, new carrier, maybe OTT. They, have, they need more cable, they need more data center. Then the, the next international network maybe is uh, say cable to the 
data center. But uh, the traditional way, the, the, the cable, uh, the, maybe from a carrier perspective, carrier needs the, the data center to the cable station, near the cable station. That's from the, that's another way. So there are many combinations could be viable in the future. Not just the one way out. Yeah, I, I think the problem is not maybe just the collaboration between a data center and a uh, submarine cable. The, the, the problem is, and as we've seen recently with CMV5 and AE1, is how to access a, a, a neutral, a car neutral data center so that the, 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 the connectivity can be easily exchanged and cheaply. That, that's the, the real issue. And that's the reason why we'll see, I guess, more and more uh, uh, cooperation between uh, your neutral data centers and uh, cable systems so that this promise is actually delivered. Because landing in a data center is, is not the end, it's just a name. Hmm? If I may just turn around, we're at a subsea cable conference. My background is not data center, it's in fact subsea cable. Seven or eight years ago, my number one concern was DC power security, earthing, and the ability to sell spectrum or fiber. We now fast forward very quickly, and the subsea cable providers are still very keen, and understandably, to either sell fiber or not sell fiber to networks, to cloud providers, but it goes beyond that. The subsea cable guys are now keen to continue their product life cycle, to continue to sell. Companies such as Seacom um, started off selling spectrum and capacity. But those guys are now looking at the enterprise market. And if you look at the average data center, which we both have a number of, an example is that Paris Sequinix has 150 network operators. So when a subsea cable system lands, they can do the data center, DC power, earthing, they can sell spectrum, but they can also access the cloud customers who may have not bought capacity. They can access pharmaceutical, medical, banking, finance, gaming. So it, it, it greatly enhances their ability to sell to many markets. And enterprises have not historically looked at wholesale purchasing, but subsea cable systems deployed in DCs has made it very simple for customers to actually purchase subsea capacity between locations and satisfy their need and factor in cloud and connectivity. And, and we can, both of us can, can absolutely categorically confirm the safety of their data in our DCs. The issue is when it leaves the DC, all the points Todd raised have become key. I'd like to uh, open it up to the floor now, uh, if there are any questions from the audience for the panel. Question or no? No questions? OK. Um, so I guess then uh, we just uh, have a couple of minutes left. Um, maybe if, if we could just uh, go down the line and, and just hear your, uh, your, your summarizing thoughts and, and where the industry is headed, what you see as uh, the, uh, the future landscape in terms of, of competitors and what the major challenges are. Just what, what's your uh, hot button topic that we should be paying attention to in the data center industry for the next uh, uh, few years. I, I think I'll continue with my trend, of which I mentioned earlier, that we believe that data centers that have a good set of submarine cables coming in directly are the ones that will succeed as hubs. And uh, to Keith's point earlier itself, that when we were doing CME 5, we wanted to, it to land in uh, Equinix Singapore so, and Global Switch. So it, it is that for the success of the cable and for the data center, it's vital that they, they coexist. So I, I think that's how we see it. So I think in the future, the challenger for carrier is that for the big pops can be big data center. 
but for some, some, not every country can be your data center, okay? So that for some, re, some developing, underdeveloping country, so you cannot have a good coverage in the future. I think that's a challenge. Yeah, I, th I think if you, if you look at the physical level, uh, multiple cable systems, multiple data centers providing an increased uh, amount of reliability on the network, if you apply that to, again, bringing it back to the regulatory issues, right, it, when, you, when you look at the, the patchwork of regulations and, and, and a converged supplier uh, in terms of data center operators and, and cable operators, integrating and converging your oversight and your compliance solutions so that, you know, because as this issue, issue becomes to be, be, continues to become more prominent, I can see a time where compliance reliability becomes a major purchasing consideration in addition to network reliability. I think interconnection is good for all of us. There's been more subsea cables built in the last five years, seven years, than the last 15. We are building more data centers as our interaction, as our do. Wait and see what happens with 5G and IOA and IOT. So it's interesting. If you give people bandwidth, they will use it. We see in Equinix that maybe we are not building such large playing fields of data centers such as Aspen, but we are building data centers such as Helsinki 6, which is a much larger, closer to the edge, closer to the market data center. But it's been driven by interconnection. I spent already uh, almost 18 years at Interaction. Uh, I can witness that what we've got in front of us will be really different in terms of uh, uh, demand and, and growth. So they, 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 and, and at the same time, for the data center industry, there are more and more everyday buyers uh, to new entrants. Uh, so the, 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 the problem is, uh, is more how to access, in some places, power, how to access capital uh, to uh, follow the, 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 the demand, which is increasing every day. That, that's, that's one of the aspects that we have to deal with in the near future. OK. Mahesh, Wei uh, Todd, uh, Keith, and Fabrice, thank you very, very much. Let's thank the panel. Thank you. I face the oven.